Good morning and welcome here in this very beautiful room. Welcome to the Protector of the Save the Children Denmark, His Royal Highness, Crown Prince Frederick. Welcome to the Prime Minister and to the Minister for Cooperation for Development Cooperation and welcome to you, guests, participants, and a special hello to all of you all around the world who follow us today via streaming, whether you do it in Danish or in English. Today is a day of celebration. We celebrate the 75th anniversary of Save the Children Denmark, uh, 75 years of a stop and fight for children's rights, both in Denmark, but also in the rest of the world. But it's also a serious day because, the, because millions of children around the world still need our help. And all of us here have a big challenge and a big responsibility to make sure that we can continue to safeguard children and their mental health and well-being. Save the Children Denmark started in, uh, grew out of the ruins of World War II, where Europe's hungry children uh, were marked by the terrors of war. Uh, today, the work is mainly takes place in vulnerable states, and and children uh, are on the run, without safety, without schools, without all the things that belong or uh, belong to a childhood. And one of the key jobs of the of Save the Children of Denmark is to give psychosocial help to children all over the world because they are marked by wars and crises and catastrophes. And that's why you're all here today, politicians, experts, professionals, donors, because if we are to succeed in securing the mental health and well-being of the many children and make sure that they're not permanently damaged, then we all have to make an effort. So it's a celebration, a day of celebration on a serious background. But still, we will start with the celebration because this morning we will first and foremost mark the anniversary. You will meet the Crown Prince, uh, the Prime Minister, Minister for Development Cooperation, and the General Secretary General. And after lunch, we will be a little bit more serious. We will start the debate on some of the really big, serious challenges that we face right now, um, challenges that uh, will lead to the mental health, well, health and well-being of children. So, Save the Children Denmark have asked me to thank people who have made this day possible. First and foremost, the Danish Chamber of Commerce, which has lent us this beautiful room. And then Inomenta, who has developed and don donated the app that which uh, gathered the program of the day so that we can avoid using a lot of papers or so on. And then I also want to say uh, thank you to MHPSS uh, Collaborative, which is the help, uh, knowledge center for psychosocial support and health. And they have do this with support from Danida, and they have contributed greatly to today's program. And then I also have a uh, very many comments uh, as regards health. Uh, you have to do that nowadays. So here today, you can only walk walk in one direction all the time. So you come in through this door over here, and then you walk out in the door over there. So please follow the arrows. Please keep your distance. Please wash your hands. Please. <laughs> And also, I have to tell you, there's a toilet at the bottom of the room, down the steps. And to avoid the queues, you can just sneak out whenever you need to. And perhaps you notice the teddy bears on the chairs. And they're here to keep us company, but also to help people on the first row to keep their distance. So if there's a teddy bear on the chair, the chair is occupied and you're not allowed to sit there. So the teddy bears are actually on at work today. They are. We have borrowed them from the various uh, shops, recycling shops of Save the Children Denmark. And after today, they'll be sold uh, to contribute to the work of Save the Children Denmark. These were the initial comments. Thank you for your patience. And now we are ready for the actual anniversary. And I'd like to show you some of the examples that uh, Save the Children Denmark have done since the beginning in 1945. kun noget, man mærker fysisk. Det er i allerhøjeste grad noget, man mærker øh, i hovedet, i sindet, i hjertet. I ruinerne fra 2. verdenskrig startede Red Barnet sit arbejde for at hjælpe verdens børn. 500.000 udsultede børn over hele Europa nød godt af Red Barnets nødhjælpspakker. Børnene var stærkt mærket af krigens rædsler. De havde også brug for omsorg og et mentalt pusterum for at genvinde tilliden til verden omkring dem. 
så red barnet sørget for, at 21.000 børn kom til Danmark på rekreationsophold hos danske familier. Børnene husker især den kærlighed og omsorg, de fik. Jeg knyttede mig straks til min mor. Når vi kom hjem fra skole, fik jeg et rigtig kammeret, og bagefter smurte min mor min krop ind i Nivea-creme. Det glemte jeg aldrig. Jeg vil aldrig glemme de glade øjeblik, jeg har tilbragt sammen med min danske familie. Jeg har lært at lægge mærke til de andre og få øjnene op for deres måde at leve på og respektere dem, og til slut også at holde af dem, som de er. Efter tre måneder skulle børnene hjem igen. Det kunne både ses og mærkes på dem, at de havde fået det langt bedre. Hvis du har hørt bomber eksplodere omkring dig, og du har måttet flygte fra dit eget hjem, så kan du få psykiske skader, som påvirker dig resten af livet. Børnene kan få angst, indlæringsvanskeligheder og en aggressiv adfærd over for andre mennesker. På længere sigt er risikoen, at man kan få depression eller selvmordstanker. Men den gode nyhed er, at børn kan hele, hvis de får den rigtige hjælp, der skal til for at komme sig over de frygtelige ting, som ingen børn skal opleve. til Jordan sammen med vores protektor, hans kongelige højhed, Kronprinsen, og udviklingsminister Rasmus Prehn for at se vores arbejde med de syriske flygtningebørn og deres forældre. Børnene lærer igennem musik, historier og små opgaver af samarbejde og danne venskaber. Det opbygger deres selvtillid og tillid til andre. Mange børn har også brug for at tale og være sammen med en voksen med psykologisk viden og overskud. Psykologerne også og fra øh, kvinderne, der, der omgås de her børn, at, at de ser bare glade børn fra, fra dag til dag, øh, når de har dem øh, under deres vinger. Netop det med det, det psykosociale, det, det har vist at være øh, et kæmpe asset, øh, som der er rigtig meget potentiale i frem efter. Det, der har gjort allerstørst indtryk på mig uh, her i Sartre-lejren i dag, det er det engagement, som der bliver lagt for dagen, blandt andet fra Red Barnes uh, medarbejdere, som har et fantastisk fokus på at sikre uh, mental sundhed for børn. Det er virkelig imponerende. Behovet for psykosocialt støtte til børn har aldrig været større nu. NGO'er, regeringer og fonde verden over bør investere meget mere i mental sundhed. Der er brug for at udbrede psykologisk viden og kompetencer i konfliktramte områder, hvis vi skal sikre, at børnene vokser op som stærke mennesker, der kan bidrage til at genopbygge deres samfund og skabe fred. Det gør jeg mig stolt som projekter for barnet, at, at barnet har eksisteret som organisation i 75 år. At vi nu er ligesom klar på vores tiltag, som er meget vigtige. At, at, øh, at få belyst og få med på at hjælpe og løfte børn ud af trauma. At det, det her at barnet endnu en gang er, som siger, fremløber på, det, 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 det er fantastisk. Ja. Yes. So the work continues. And the work helps. And now I'll ask you to welcome Secretary General for Safety in Denmark, Johanna Schmidt Nielsen. Thank you very much. We have looked forward so much to today, and we're so happy that we managed to organize this day. And a special welcome to our patron, His Royal Highness Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark, and. Welcome to the representatives from the government, our Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen and Minister for Development Cooperation, Rasmus Brehn. And welcome also to, to the rest of you to, to support the work for the war-torn of the war-injured children of 
Europe. This is what it said on our first poster from 1945. And at that time, lots of women and men, well, primarily women, they came together in Denmark and they looked to Europe, they looked across the borders, and they saw a lot of children which saw, who suffered. And without even hesitating, they decided to act. They gathered money, they, and they sent trains with help throughout Europe. And at the same time, they encouraged the Danes to open up their homes. And even though the war had also been difficult for many families in Denmark, more, more, several hundred families opened their doors and and welcomed those children from Europe. And therefore, the trains came back to Denmark with some of the children who had experienced the terrors of war. And they were not only children uh, from our allies, but the newly established Save the Children Denmark insisted that also German children had the right to live because children are children. And one of those children uh, is you, Joop. Josef, you have, I know you call yourself Joop. Actually, you survived the concentration camp. You got help, you got food, you got care and love. And we're so grateful that later today you will share your story with us. You have also told me that not everyone in your family was as lucky as you were. Uh, your aunt, Katerina, was uh, a victim of medical trials in the concentration camp, and that killed her. The concentration camp and the Nazis killed her, even though she didn't die in the camp. Uh, she, her life ended in the channels of Amsterdam. She ended her life in the channels of Amsterdam because she could not uh, deal with all the things, all the trauma she had suffered. Uh, as you said the other day, she couldn't live with it the, because the mental, the psychological uh, issues mean a lot. The traumas mean a lot. At the time, the mental trauma from war were not something we talked about, but they were there, the traumas. And precisely those traumas uh, are the topic here today, or rather, what we can do to remedy the traumas, to heal them. Because when there's a war, then children of the world, they need medicine, they need a roof over their head, but they need more than that. It's not enough. It's not enough that they survive. They also have to live. They have to have a life. And that can only happen if we uh, consider the mental injuries uh, to a such to a similar degree as we consider physical injuries, both children and adults have mental injuries. But we have a special responsibility for the children of the world because the children are dependent on us, the adults. The children will carry the world forward, and they have, they re require and they need our protection. When I started in Save the Children Denmark, then one of my first colleagues, or one of the first colleagues that I met, was a very uh, skilled psychologist, and she told me a story that uh, is still on my mind, and I'd like to share it with you. About 10 years ago, she and other colleagues worked uh, in the northern Uganda with children who had survived uh, uh, being prisoners. Uh, they had been kidnapped by various groups, and some of the imprisoned children had actually lived as so-called wives of those soldiers, and some children had been used as soldiers in armed conflict, and they were all, they had all been abused. They had seen other children be abused, and many had also been forced uh, to abuse other children. And one of the children uh, who, uh, whom this psychologist met, her name was Gloria, and Gloria was only three or four years old when she was kidnapped. And when she was, she came back when she was eight, when she was liberated, when she was eight years old. And she was, a, she had many traumas. She was, it was difficult to stay, to be with her. She was aggressive. She would beat you. She would be angry all the time. She exploded into anger. And nobody wanted to befriend her. And her teachers were actually also a little bit afraid of her, even though she was a child. But Gloria got help. The psychologists from Save the Children, they trained her and they trained her teachers. Uh, and therefore, she got help to deal with her mental injuries, mental trauma. And she's one of the thousand life-confirming examples that you find all over the world. One of those examples that tell us that children can heal. People can heal. Children can heal. 
Gloria will never forget what's, what, she was, what she suffered, what happened to her. But because she was given the tools to understand and, and handle her and cope with her emotions, she was able to concentrate again, to focus again. Her, her teacher said she actually learned how to read and write. And her parents told us, well, she very rarely get into a fight nowadays. And, and when the psychologist asked Gloria herself, what was the biggest change, Gloria? She said, before I had no friends, now I have one. And precisely that sentence tells us what it's all about, because we know that just one friend can t- turn a life of the life of a child around. Uh, Gloria, uh, she uh, came out of her shell, and she uh, connected with another person, another human being, and she dared trust that, that someone would actually love her, and she found the courage actually to reach out to the world. And this is a, an ability that many of us take for granted. But without it, we cannot function. We cannot become adults that can, who can take care of our own children. We cannot contribute to the community and, and live in peace or in harmony with people around us. And there are children, there are thousands of children, millions of children that are robbed of parts of their entire childhood. And we owe those children to do all we can to ensure that they heal. We cannot just leave them alone with their thoughts, their traumas, and the future and the world need them to grow up and become well-functioning individuals who not only survive, but who live. Right now, uh, 415 million children uh, live in areas, war-torn areas, areas with conflicts and crisis. And this is the highest number since World War II. And those children, they need Uh, they have the right to professional and psychosocial support, and it's a huge task, and no one can do it alone. We have to do it together. The world together, the WHO, governments, neighbors, uh, civil organizations, uh, children's mental health have to be part of everything we do. We have to consider that always. Together with UNICEF and the WHO and with support from Danita, we have developed the program I Support My Friends, which consists of methods and tools uh, to help people in crisis so they can help them to help each other. Of course, we adults, we have the responsibility for their mental health and well-being, but often the, the friend of the child is the first person the child would reach out to. And therefore, it's so important that the children know what to do and how when to ask for help and where they can get help. And we can never, we must never underestimate their own resources. His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, and the Minister for Development Cooperation uh, traveled with us uh, to the Satari camp in Jordan, uh, at the, on the border of, uh, of Syria and Jordan. And we visited one of the football clubs, uh, a club for ch- girls. And we met a very young girl there. And she stood there with a straight, stood up very straight. And she came from war, and she had uh, uh, left the war. But she stood up straight, and she told us how she had broken the engagement uh, that almost ended in a child marriage. And this is a very big thing to actually break off an engagement like that. It takes courage, and it it requires that you can sense yourself, you can feel yourself, you know yourself, and you know what you want. It also requires that you can imagine that that there could be an alternative, that your brain actually can find uh, these ideas, uh, find the ideas of a different world. And it it takes self-esteem, because you have to believe in yourself and believe that you're worth something uh, uh, in order for, if you're not, you cannot reach out to other people. And she did reach out, and, and, and that is exactly what the psychosocial support is all about, because our voluntary trainers in Sartori, of course, they have to make sure that those kids, that those girls, that they learn how to play football and, and so on. But not just football, but they are not just working with football. They also work with strengthening their um, self-esteem, their self-confidence, the ability to feel themselves, to sense themselves, and to imagine that the world can be different. And when this girl reads out, somebody was there to catch her. And this story shows how crucial this psychosocial support is, and, and it also shows us that it works. Here in Denmark, we have a long tradition for working with the mental health and well-being of children. 
And when it comes to psychosocial support for children in crisis, we have so many competences and skills in these countries across authorities and organizations. We have solid knowledge, many years of experience. We have the tools to help children both uh, preventive efforts and uh, acute efforts and, and long-term efforts. And our special position as a front-runner country also gives us a special responsibility. And I think we can be proud of the role that we play. Uh, only uh, last week or the week before last, the government in their budget said that, uh, that they would double Denmark's contribution to WHO. That is important and it's wise and it's also an investment that at the same time gives us the opportunity to show the world that mental health should be, bal uh, should be equal to physical health. So we would like to encourage the government to take up this challenge. Today now only 1% of the uh, contribution in the world goes to to mental health. We would like to change that because it's too little, and we would like to do that together with you and all the good forces that are here today, all our partner organizations and governments and civil organizations and so on. So we would like you to do this or take up this challenge. I would like to end by saying 75 years ago, war was part of your everyday life in Denmark and the, our neighboring countries in Europe. Today, the, the wars and the conflicts are fought a long way from here, far away from here. But the children who live in the middle of this, for them, it, it's close. They live uh, close to it. The investigations that we have carried out show that it's even more dangerous to be a child in a conflict or a war now. The number of children who are abused, uh, that number rises all the time, increases all the time. And therefore, there's a need for ensuring that the children uh, get a childhood that that kind of help is more important than ever. The situation is serious. The task is huge. But sometimes I say it can be so huge that sometimes you feel disempowered. And still, I'm here and feel hopeful, so hopeful. It gives so much hope to think of the of the children, the boys and girls that we met in Satara, that despite the fact that they lived in the shadow of war in a refugee camp in the middle of a desert in Jordan with parents who have felt the war or had war traumas, that they still were able to recover. The children we met, they laughed, they ran, they played. And it gives us hope that Gloria in, in Uganda, who was, was aggressive and deeply traumatized, that she got one friend. And it gives me hope that both Gloria and the children in Saturday, they get the help, they get the crucial psychosocial support that they need. It's because governments, including the Danes, know that mental health is important for children. And because governments invest in organizations like Banded, like Save the Children, uh, we, uh, who can then develop the necessary programs and tools and knowledge. Uh, and then I'm sure, because before long, we will hear uh, your speech, your and I'm sure that I speak on behalf of all of us that it gives us hope to hear you tell us your story and, and feel how much you insist on us remembering what happened then because it can never happen again and we need to fight for the children of the world. When we think of the volunteers who welcome you and many other children of the war, uh, were victims of war, then again, we are reminded what, what a huge difference people can do if they actually reach out to each other. The children of the world need us to, to work together to ensure their mental health, volunteers, professionals, organizations, governments, because, as I've said, children should not just survive, children must live. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much, Johannes Smith Nielsen. So let's look in more detail about what it is that we specifically do with the work that Red Barth, say the children is actually doing. What is it that they do when they are dealing with children who are suffering because of conflicts and wars throughout the world that they feel it themselves? For that purpose, we're going to hear from uh, Sophie Boeing Alcott and Anna Sophie Dubdal. She's a psychologist and she knows about such injuries that children may feel. Please come up. Hello, everybody. 
as Tina said, my name is Steen. I am the chairwoman of Save the Children Youth Division. I am here today to talk to you about the organization that I represent and the work that we do to improve the mental health of children. And because the, because the youth organization is also part of the 75-year-old history, we're here as well. 58 years after Save the Children was established, young volunteers decided that now was the time for a youth division for young people who wanted to do volunteer work within the parameters of Save the Children based on the UN Children's Convention. Therefore, they went to the Secretary General at the time of Save the Children, who supported, I'm trying with the microphone here, that we wanted to establish a separate uh, Save the Children Youth Division. Today, we are an organization. We do learning cafes, role model projects, uh, learning activities for children uh, who are refugees here in Denmark. Every week, young volunteers, they meet every, d every week. They meet if they need extra support in life. We are an independent organization, but still we have close ties to save the children. We are in the same house, we have the same name, and we work together for the most important course in the world. We have recently launched a project where some of our homework volunteers are matched with children from uh, Save the Children families, and they are actually able to work together. And when we work together across organizations, we are able to reach even more children and families in Denmark and in the world in general. In our organization, we believe that mental health is more important than ever before. We believe that we, through activities and activities, can ensure the well-being of children, and therefore we want to create meaningful relationships between young people and children. Because what we see is that this has great value, that children meet people who are volunteers, and then we have young people dealing with children that we can ensure their well-being. Every day, young volunteers, they dedicate, we have up to 1,800 volunteers, they dedicate time to spend time with children children who are in need of a friend or a community. I used to be a volunteer myself when I was 20 and when I lived in Hanas. Uh, let, let me just help you with the microphone. I, I, I was told how to fix it. So you need to be closer to the microphone and they promised me that they will fix the problem. Hopefully this will work now. I'm not in front of a microphone that often, but but as I said, I used to be a volunteer, and what we did was to work with the children at the center, asylum center where I worked. We told them again and again that we were volunteers, and that was because me and others, they we learned how much it meant for the children that they met young people who were there because they wanted to, they wanted to spend some of their spare time on these activities. Meeting these young volunteers, the children felt seen, they felt heard, they felt respected. And respecting children and their rights is for us and Save the Children part of our foundation. We want to empower children to have faith in themselves, to the, have faith in the world around them so that they will manage better in life going forward. We want to support the notion of children having rights they are experts in their own lives. They should be allowed a say in what happens in their lives. An example from our work, where we work with mental health, is that when we meet Article 31 of the Children's Convention with the children's right to spare time and rest, we do that when we are working with refugee children in asylum centers and with children and families who have already been granted a residence permit. It's also when we work with children who are lonely, we help them have find a friend and find somebody to share experiences. We do just plain old activities, play and games. We in strengthen their social skills. We do this 
simply because children are allowed to have a good life. We, they are entitled to feel this sense of well-being. I'm so happy to be here today to celebrate this anniversary. We are part of Save the Children, and we are focusing on such an important uh, topic as mental health among children. I'm going to now let Sophie from, um, about, from Save the Children speak. She's a psychologist. And this, this ties nicely in with what we're going to be talking now. Mental health, psychosocial health, is all about how do we handle any challenges and crises that we may face, how we feel about ourselves and the people around us. But what does it actually mean in real terms? In Save the Children and many others like us, we work with people, adults, children who have had a bad experience uh, that has cast a shadow on their life and even in their life going forward. We work with people in crisis, something that will not just go away on its own, even though many people are surprisingly robust. Children in war, in conflict, we know, we've seen, they have been exposed to a number of risks. It's not just one event that they have faced, but it's an overall, it's an accumulated sequence of things like poverty, being exposed, lack of schooling, having to uh, flee. And children are a, what we call a moving target because they develop. When we work with children, so we have to have adapted efforts so that we can match the children who is three, four, eight, even 15 years old. We go through a course of life with them. The children we work with, they mostly have a complex history. So if we've seen the arc of life, so to speak, that would usually be like this. Some traumatic events can sort of bend the arc of life in an inappropriate direction. It can also mean that the overall effect of lack of schooling, of violence in the home, loneliness being exposed, all of that can lead to a troubled arc of life where the child has not been given the opportunity to develop as they normally would have. It all depends on the age of the child and the problems the child is facing. Is this a seriously traumatized child in need of treatment? Or is it a child where we, with very small initiatives, midget initiatives here and there, we can then push them in the right direction? And we have different levels of activities that we use. Psychological first aid is one of the cornerstones of our uh, toolbox. We, it's all about training. Anybody working with children in crisis, they should be trained in how to talk to a child in crisis, how do I spot what is needed, you know, this small, short, teeny tiny alteration that might be needed to avoid further psychological problems, crime or any aggressive behavior in the future. For infants, we mainly deal with mothers. We see, we look for signs of depression. We try to improve the relationship between the mother and the child and the father and the child. We specifically focus on the mother or the father's willingness and dedication to playing with the child, talking to the child, interacting with the child. Because a little mind, a young mind like that, they need a lot of uh, nutrition. Older children, like we saw in Saturday, we could do kindergarten activities for those children who are able to engage in those sorts of activities, they learn to focus. And we can focus on the part of the brain that might need one of those teeny tiny adjust uh, adjustments to go in the right direction. And we have areas where children can come to play. It may look simple on the surface, but it's 
based on complicated psych psychological theory about the development in children. We want to make sure that their short-term memory and long-term memory works so that they can gain something from what they learn. For older children, young people, if we first encounter them later in life and the arc of life has gone off in an unfortunate direction for the child, for society in general, then our efforts may be of a different nature. It works best when we do this together, when we do mental health and psychosocial efforts together with other programs, together with health programs, together with uh, education programs, so that we can even out any inequality. Our social workers are trained in how to work with suicide prevention, how you spot children with anxiety and PTSD on that end of the spectrum. This all costs. I mean, children may look uh, robust, but it does carry a price when it comes to their development of the brain. If you've been exposed to long-term accumulated risks, it is difficult just to have basic attention to sleep at night, to have distance, to understand the concept of distance. Children with war damages and other risks, they actually are often victims of uh, car accidents, being hit by cars more often, because it's difficult for them to determine distances. They often argue with other people. It's difficult to them to make the good choice when they, in a situation, are faced with a choice and long-term planning of education and a career, or maybe the quick buck that you can make instead. You can almost see the choice that they are faced with. So investing in mental health is an investment in the development and learning of children and how they act later in life. A lot of the things we do internationally and uh, also nationally, but across uh, our activities, there is room for inspiration. What I would like, if we could just look at the slide, I want to show you how we have borrowed from one another and gotten ideas from one another. Because in our volunteer work, we, they, they wanted a simple tool to use when a child comes back from this COVID-19 situation. And this is an example. Just a, a small tool, a modest tool that shows how thoroughly we have to think about this and how this ties in with a greater perspective. We offer something very structured under normal circumstances that because we have to be very careful about what it is that we do. A child in a refugee camp says, said to me, I want to hold your hand, but don't sit on me. And I was just, what, what does that mean? I think she meant, I want to have help. I want to ha experience solidarity and care, but I don't want to be touched. I don't want to be groped. So how do we ensure that quality is by giving structured and systematic guidance to our staff? I just quickly want to show you what this is about. It's just to do a very quick demonstration of a small corner of our entire portfolio of activities, and it's called Talk to one another about this, and there are six steps. Step one is that you are a child in the third or fourth grade. I mean, just say that to yourselves in your mind. You're in the third or fourth, fourth grade, and I would say to you, we have one hour to talk about things, how we've had, how we feel, and sometimes it's we're afraid to come back, and some people haven't liked it, and they feel that they've been left outside, they haven't had contact with friends. So we just want to make sure that everybody gets off to a good start. We talk to the children about the basic rules. There's no laughing at one another, and we have to listen to one another. Step two is talking, about the, talking to the children about what actually happened during COVID-19. And the children would think about things, and then we ask them to think about this in small groups of two or three. 
what happened was I couldn't see my nan. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't go outside enough. OK, great. And we will write everything down on a piece of paper so they see what it is that they've said. And then we take the electrical wires of the brain, so to speak, and then pluck them together so that the children can see the link between how they feel and what they have experienced. And that's the first small step of being able to handle your emotions and your actions. And it sounds simple, but for some of them, you can almost see how the brain cells are growing because they are ex able to make this connection to plug the wires together. We talk to the children about um, their emotions, not just talk about anything. We need to be able to address an open wound without pain, without them feeling pain. But it's important to learn who you are and understanding your action. I mean, it's called psycholocation, and I, you probably all know about this, but this is a well-known psychological approach. Together with the children, we try to identify what worked, what to help, what helped during this process, what are we afraid of, and how can we help one another in the future so that we can create this pathway so that we can address psychosocial issues. Um, if I could show you what we asked the children to do. We asked the children to try and think about what was good, what helped me. Well, for example, calling my nan or uh, I went online with my friends, or we had the same routine every day, and we remind them that there are actually things that you can do to manage stress. So if I could now ask you to stand up, and then we show them, this is very simple, and it's simple on purpose. So we say to them, okay, take your right hand and clench the fist, and you really clench the fist, and then you release. And we look and we see that the children do this. And then I ask them to clench their left fist and you clench the fist tightly and then you release. And you can sit down again, thank you. So what we do is that we establish a feeling of control with the children and we remind them that there are things that they themselves can do. And this is the first small way to do activities, how to exercise in your life, and how we can help each other, remind each other to take care of one another. That was just a small bit of the simplest types of programs that we do with children. Hopefully, that creates imagery in your mind. And we're looking forward to the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to uh, Anne-Sophie Dupdale and Stine boring Algard, Stine and Sophie Dupdale for these specific methods that you mentioned with traumatized children. Now, again, we're going to discuss the anniversary, the 75 years of anniversary. Now we're going to hear from the prime minister. Thank you very much. And first and foremost, thank you for some very warm hearted, uh, warm heartfelt, warm hearted uh, presentations. I think the very three clever women have already said what has to be said today, and I can just add a little bit to that. And first and foremost, a very huge congratulations to you uh, with your anniversary uh, 75 years of, of, of struggle for vulnerable children for rights, for justice, and you can be very proud of this, and I hope you are very proud of this. I, I know you will say that, it, well, today is not about us, but still I would like you to feel proud. You s use the day, uh, today's day, it's, uh, you use it uh, not just, uh, you, do not, you do not just celebrate the past, but you also use this occasion to actually put the children first, and the most vulnerable group of children first, those that are uh, left in war-torn areas of displaced children. As you already said, you were formed and uh, established in the ruins of World War II, uh, when braved people who had hearts and will and, 
and acted when it was necessary to act. And back then and now, millions of children were were victims of war. And the terrible images that we see from war zones in faraway countries today, well, back then, they were only a short drive away. Uh, Volunteers, uh, they were back then, and voluntary work has carried uh, Save the Children. And thank you for that. And no matter how good we are in this great uh, society of ours, there will still be thousands of children who need your assistance. But at that time, also, volunteers uh, went out uh, in the world with food and and necessities. And from France, they reported back home that people were living in basements without lights, without uh, any heat. And they said that many children have lost their parents. And from school kitchens in Poland, uh, Save the Children uh, handed out various kinds of food to the children of, in the ruins of Poland and financed. This was financed by the Danes, actually. And, and one of the work volunteers at that time said this development should have been filmed so the contributors could see how much joy they create in the heart of children here. They have, I'm sure they were right, but we all know the images, the photos, also the ones that we never see. Uh, at the same time, there were thousands of Danish families welcomed uh, children, and we have one of these children here today. The purpose back then were to give them a, a, a stay for some months, to give them a break from the terrors of war. Uh, the idea was that the children should recover uh, physically, and we saw f- from the video uh, that they they managed that, uh, and also at that, but also their mental health. Actually, I was focused on the mental health also. And you were one of those children, Joop, and it's a great honor that you are here today. Uh, His Royal Highness, Crown Prince Frederick, and, and I, we were so lucky to meet you before we started. Last year, we gave each other a, a hug in, when we met in the synagogue, and we promised each other we will not do it this year. I think we'll, we'll agree that after Corona, we will actually be hugging each other once again. <laughs> well, the, your story is is very moving, and thank you so much for sharing it, and thank you for for keeping this memory in our minds, and thank you for reminding us that the story must be told again and again and again. It can never be forgotten. In time, we are, have become wiser. We now know that a childhood is not just a preparation for adulthood. We know that the first thousand days are the most significant ones. We need know that repair work is extremely important in every society. We know also today that the physical cost and the physical price of war is perhaps the, the least price that children pay. And we know that many children experience uh, the huge lack of adults or adults with uh, who can take care of them who give them uh, love and you help us remember that today more than one six of the world's children live in an area t- torn or con- with the conflict area of conflict and that are uh, talking about too many children so it, it it's now uh, that those children live in that one childhood that they have. We have only one childhood. And therefore, uh, your job and our job is urgent. And I say our job because NGOs can do a lot, but governments can even more uh, if we work together. And therefore, it's so crucial that we look out for the children uh, that whose parents do not actually are not able to handle the task. And it's also important, as I have to say as Prime Minister, that we do it here in Denmark also, because we often think that in our wealthy country that children are doing so well here, but it's not true, because too many, much too many Danish children suffer. Uh, and much too many Danish children uh, today are left uh, or by us are not taken care of because they have parents who are not able to take care of them. Too many Danish children experience violence, they experience drug abuse and alcohol abuse. And I still dare not think what kind of spring uh, many of our vulnerable children experienced when we had to have the lockdown. And and no matter how important it is to to look forward and reach out and have the and be have international solidarity, well we 
still have to keep our focus on those children. Uh, our focus, your focus on the children of Denmark because their voice is as, as insignificant or slight as it's always been. So to make a long story short, as an adult, you have to make one choice before any other choice that you make, and that is you have to put yourself on the side of the child. In, in very many situations, that means also being on the side of the parents, but not in all situations. And this, it's not, uh, we, we, can, we have to be on the side of the children. We have to give their voice more power. We have to give it more weight. We have to dare, we have to have the courage to put them first before the adults, both out in the world, and but also here in Denmark, the girl who is raped or the child who becomes a child soldier. Uh, and well, many more stories that are terrible. So, so the, the problem is not just something that relate to uh, childhood and adolescence. I th and I think actually, I think that perhaps when we worked with vulnerable children, then perhaps we've forgotten sometimes to, to focus on what happens when that vulnerable child grows up, become an adult and has a child of its own. And so I think perhaps we need to actually consider that also, or the terrible things will just happen all over again. I'm very happy to hear that you insist on, on helping the children all the way around, and we will support you in your job, because no one can expect that a small person who has been through hell can pull him or herself out of this terrible past all alone. They need our help, and therefore the Save the Children effort and focus on the psychosocial support and mental health is important, very important. We can help them when their crisis is there. We can support them and, and give them a better future. But we also have to consider the adults who look out for these children, look after those children. So we need to a higher degree to prepare children for conflict and make them more robust so in order to so they can deal better with the dangerous situation that we cannot help them with. We do that uh, here in Denmark and Save the Children. Denmark does this, and Johan have already told you how much we work together in Denmark. Uh, in these years, uh, there's a lot of talk of being the leading green nation, and we already are that, really. Um, we could also also decide that we want to be a leading nation when it comes to children at home and abroad, because Everything that we talk about today is, is, well, it's one huge obligation because there's only one childhood. A, chi a person only has one childhood. And we need to look out for that childhood. I've heard at a certain point of time that WHO, that the Secretary General of WHO had said that he was very inspired by the health service in Denmark because in the 80s he studied in this country. He saw how a small yellow card could actually gain, give you access to all the kind of, of health service that many people of the world can even not even hope for. It's it's not easy to build up a good health service f f from the from scratch uh, in many places of the world. But you contribute to that work, and I'm happy to do that as a social democrat. Of course, I have to say that you can sometimes tear down what was built up, and therefore we have to. We have to maintain uh, free and equal access to health services. You have to build on what is already there. But anyway, thank you very much for your work. And children always need someone to speak on their behalf, but not only speak, but also act on their behalf. And you have shown for 75 years that you do just that. And 75 years in Denmark, well, that is a, a, a human life. But it's not a human life in many of these places uh, in the world where you've helped. You have not just fought uh, to save life, but also to improve lives. And in many ways, well, I would hope that there was no need for you, but there is need for you, and there will still be need for you. In one of your first posters, another one, it said, the, the uh, needs is still there. Please continue helping. And I would like to... Uh, to repeat this message today. Thank you very much. Please continue your good work and congratulations for your anniversary. Thank you very much. To our Prime Minister, 
Uh, unfortunately, she has to leave us right away. Unfortunately, she has a side gig that she has to handle. Thank you so much for coming. We are not going to leave governmental level yet. We have another representative. And if there is one minister who follows your work intensely, then it is Minister for Development Corporation, Rasmus Brehn. Here he is. Your Royal Highness, the Prime Minister had to leave us because she had another important meeting. Secretary General Johannes Medjelsen, Josef here in the front row, Job. all of you good people and save the children, but most of all, to all the children of the world, congratulations with the 75th anniversary of Save the Children, because the children are what it's all about. And Luckily, that is clear from the way that you've chosen to celebrate yourselves today. The children are at the center. I thought about the fact when the PM mentioned this, your poster, and I'm thinking about this. When I walk up the stairs at the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the sixth floor, the first thing that I see is the first poster from Save the Children, which is on the wall next to my desk. A small girl with hair parted to the side, with a shy but yet insistent uh, gaze. She looks at me every day. This poster is from 1945. Back then, it was all about supporting the children who were victims of war in Europe. And we've heard more about this today. We will hear Yorps fantastic story about he was one of the first children who got on the train, came to Denmark. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us here today. But also when you go out on uh, lecture tours uh, around the country and you are part of articles, it's so important. When I look at my poster and I think of your story, you'll, I know how important my work is. And if, in fact, that I had any doubt then Johanna has written a personal dedication in beautiful handwriting on my poster about how important it is to work with the children of the world. Thank you so much. We share a big beating heart when it comes to children, when we want about giving them a good, safe life. It is no longer just about the, the children of Europe. It's about all our children. It's about the children of the world. Save the Children has a mission that is one of the noblest uh, in the world, which is taking care of children. A society should be measured on how they deal with their most vulnerable, and children are among our most vulnerable. There are 2.2 billion children in the world. 1.9 billion of them are in developing countries, many of them starving, many of them will never go to school, some of them uh, suffer assaults. They are married off. Some fall pregnant way too early. They are sent to war. So therefore, it's so important that Denmark contributes to ensuring children in developing countries a good life. And that is about more than food and water. It's about safety. It's about receiving input. It's about playing. It's about activity. We've already seen some excellent examples here today. It's about mental health. It's about well-being. It's about hope. In the history of the world begins in the nursery. We had Johan Pistolosi, who was the inventor of uh, pedagogical um, concepts. As Danes, we can be proud of the efforts of Save the Children, and we can be proud of our overall efforts. In March, I went uh, with His Royal Highness, uh, the Crown Prince, to Sartori in Jordan. Here we saw, with our own eyes, the efforts of the good, important work that Save the Children do to ensure the mental health and well-being of children. We went to a kindergarten. You saw the photos early on. We played football with the children. That was great fun. It was great to experience the the joy, the the or the willingness to live that the children had, even though they were living in the most bleak of circumstances. After 
having played football, having gone to the kindergarten, I knew that the work that, say, the children do gives hope to the children of Sartori. It's said that we as people can live maybe 40 days without food, maybe four days without water, and we can live up to four minutes without oxygen. I don't think that we can live even a second without hope. Children have this instinctive curiosity and their an impatience to see life. They can do almost anything if they're just given the opportunity. They're not that many opportunities when you live a life full of starvation, distress, violence, and conflict. So we have to continue to do our very best to give better circumstances to more children, to protect children in developing countries. And that is more important than ever. COVID-19 has had very strong implications for the most vulnerable children over the world. Uh, at some point, nine out of 10 children in the world did not even get to go to school this year. And we know that there's a great risk that children in the most poor countries will never even go back to school once things have gone back to normal. For many of them, school is not about just about education. It's also about safety. It's about well-being. It's about friendship. And at least one nutritious meal that they are given at lunch at school. But stable schooling is just one thing. When it comes to ensuring their mental health and well-being in areas of crisis, it is very important that we work with these concepts of well-being and mental health on a um, wider scale. And I'm so happy with the strategic cooperation that we have and that mental health and psychosocial stability is incorporated in more uh, aid efforts in Yemen and in Syria and also in the Sahel region. It's very important. I'm also happy to note that Denmark uh, is a major contributor to Education Cannot Wait, who is a, which is an organization that ensures education in these uh, areas of crisis, where this is part of the efforts that are made. In July, Education Cannot Wait had a $13 million efforts announced to ensure that a quarter of billion children, million children in Sahel would have access to education. That is just brilliant. We can only be proud of the fact that we are part of financing the collaborative and knowledge center in this area here in Copenhagen. Save the Children is one of the most important players in mental health and psychosocial support. The work with children's health and uh, well-being should be incorporated with other efforts. In Jordan, where we went, it was clear that mental health and well-being also play a role in other important areas. For example, at the football school for girls, we already heard for, from Johanne, where we met this wonderful, strong young girl who got up and told her story to say how she had been forced to get engaged, but how the psychosocial efforts of Save the Children had given her the energy, uh, the powers to say no and take control over her own life and focus on education. We need to become even better at these across uh, organization cooperation to give access to education and much more for the children of the, of the world. A green transition, a sustainable development is also very important in this aspect. Safety does not come automatically. It is a result of collective unity and investments. We owe it to our children, to the most vulnerable of our society, that we can give them a life without violence and fear. That's what Nelson Mandela said. And we shouldn't hesitate to, hes to repeat what he said today. Children are only about one third of humanity, but they are the they are hundred percent of our future. Where well, Stafford, the former president of Compassionate International, said that if we give nourishment to their to the dreams of children, the world will be blessed. If we destroy their dreams, the world will be doomed to fail. Save the children has been on the side 
of the children for a full 75 years. We have to face, and unfortunately, you are still needed for many years to come. But what you do is great. You are greatly needed, especially now. I thank you for the bottom of my heart to save the children for the work that you do, and a big congratulations on your anniversary. Thank you so much to our minister uh, for what he had to say. Not only the Danish government appreciates Save the Children and their work, all of the EU does that, but we have all this whole traveling and international visits that is a bit uh, difficult at the moment. We still wanted the commissioner for um, the European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations wanted to send a message here today. Here you go. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Save the Children Denmark for inviting me to speak with you here today. While the current circumstances prevent us from being together in person, I wish to congratulate Save the Children Denmark on reaching your 75th anniversary. Over the years, you have played a vital role in raising awareness of the challenges faced by children in crisis-affected regions. This has never been more important than in today's environment. Throughout the world, we continue to see the devastating impact that emergencies have on our children's lives and future. In addition to the physical suffering, we continue to see a rise in mental health disorder amongst young people living in these areas. That is why the European Union is attaching great importance to address this issue in our humanitarian response. Together with our partners on the ground, we have stepped up our efforts to include mental health and psychosocial support in our humanitarian interventions. We recently launched a new programmatic partnership with Save the Children Denmark to help with this effort. Over a three-year period, this pilot program will address the mental health needs of over 200,000 children affected by recent emergencies in Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger. We will do this by providing quality services across multiple sectors, including health, protection and education. More importantly, this program will reduce the psychological toll faced by young boys and girls living in the Sahel region. As humanitarians, this should always be one of our main concerns. Events like today's conference provide a valuable opportunity to exchange experiences and to share common achievements as we look to address this pressing issue. As we seek to support the most vulnerable children around the world, I look forward to hearing your recommendations on how to address these mental health challenges. Thank you. Dear colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Well, OK, I think I will stop before we hear the video once again. So thank you to the words from the commissioner. So Save the Children makes a great difference throughout the world. Experts, professionals, volunteers, donors, all kinds of people make a great effort to the benefit of the children of the world. The patron of Save the Children, Denmark, knows this. He follows this, the work closely. He traveled to the area where the work really helps. So it's a great honor to welcome His Royal Highness, Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark. Thank you very much. Also for me, <laughs> I also want to say a Huge congratulations to you and give you a virtual hug, all of you. Of course, I'm extremely pleased to be here and very proud to be here and to be the patron of an organization which for so many years has been a front runner uh, to help children. And the work to ensure a good childhood for a child, for a person, is the most significant kind of job you can do. And as father of four, I really know this. I officially took over the role as patron in 2002 after my grandmother, the 
Queen Ingrid of Denmark. But I knew about the organization some years from some years before through a friend of my father's, but that's a different story. So I think it's great and it's it's fantastic that the organization today is one of the strongest organizations in Denmark when it comes to emergency organizations and, and aid organizations, but but also it, it's a, a topic uh, that the of, of the psychosocial a topic that Save the Children in Denmark have put much focus on, and we can see that there'll be so much more focus on this topic in the future, especially here in Denmark, and but uh, perhaps also the EU. Who knows? My grandmother's hearts will uh, beat for children, vulnerable children. She felt for vulnerable children, especially the children who, in her day, was 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 injured or were injured by the wars, war in Europe. She was born in 1920, she came, 1910, she came from Stockholm in Sweden to Denmark, and she was in Denmark throughout the German occupation, and that uh, really made an impact on her and being occupied by a, a foreign nation like Denmark was. Uh, that really, she felt that and meant something. So there's a direct line through what, uh, from what my experience, my grandmother experienced till today, uh, to the job that the Save the Children Denmark carries out today, the work to help children who are victims of wars and catastrophes. I've been able to follow this work, and I've worked to, to follow it closely, uh, especially in Denmark, but also in the rest of the world. Here in Denmark, I've seen how you strengthen children's mental health and that how children go out into the into nature and, and and meet friends and gain confidence in themselves and trust in themselves and the world around them and it really touches your heart when you work with children that you've never met before uh, children you've never met before and you only have perhaps some hours with them and then suddenly this a child sort of of, of takes your hand and that kind of trust is something that really touches you and, and you think, perhaps you think uh, two hours, that's not a lot, so how would that help? But then this child comes up and, and, and takes your hand and then that just moves you. Uh, and because those children, they do not really know who I am and what, who I, what I represent. And therefore it's so great that they show me this kind of trust and, it gives, uh, and that we can reach children in this way. Uh, recently, as have been, you, have, as you have been told and as you've seen, uh, I went with uh, Johannes smith Nielsen and our uh, minister, Rasmus Prehn, and we went to, uh, to the refugee camp um, at just a few kilometers from the Syrian Jordanian border. Uh, about 70,000 displaced people live there. About half of them are children, and many of them have lived, lived their entire life in the camp. Perhaps they did not experience the war, but they experienced being uh, amputated, so to speak, from the country to which they belong, their native country. Uh, and others, uh, when we met them, they were so uh, old that they had experienced the war and and being refugees. And, and of course, they have seen war with their own eyes, and many have experienced war in their own bodies. And Save the Children Denmark it work to help those children and uh, their parents make sure they have a roof over their head, that they can go to school, and that they have time to play and the opportunity to play. And in particular, the Save the Children focus on the professional help uh, to children who are uh, impacted uh, or by war in a mental way that need psychosocial support. And so, so the psychosocial support is uh, important and, and it made a great impression on me uh, that when I experienced the uh, kindergarten in the Saturday camp that it was filled with, with actually smiling children, children that were able to play and communicate also with our delegation. Uh, we were of course very enthusiastic but still uh, they, I mean they were receptive to our presence uh, even though Perhaps we could seem a little bit massive in our presence, <laughs> still. <laughs> but still, we we managed to reach them in in a good way. And again, there were children who were able to play, and they 
could manage to learn also, we could see that. And especially they were able to spend time together with other children, they were able to manage that. Uh, here in, in Denmark, we sort of expect that this happened automatically. Well, if we as parents can't handle it, then we just hand them over to schools or, or kindergarten and they will take care of it. Uh, so these things work very well in Denmark. But, but there are children who are traumatized and children uh, who, who find it very difficult just to play and to learn and to, to be part of a community or, or and to be together with other children. And therefore, we have to help those children. We have to help them to cope with the, with the violent and the traumatized experiences, experience that, that they feel deep in their heart because this is the precondition for, the, for them to be able to grow up and live, uh, 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 first of all, a good, well-functioning childhood, because a good, well-functioning childhood is the basis of a good adulthood, uh, the way we are in the world as adults. And, and the children uh, who we work with today, uh, well, and want to help, they are the children who will help build up the future and peaceful societies. So if the, so if the only thing you can actually think about is the sound of bombs that, that explode, then you cannot learn anything at school. And if you've seen or been the a victim of t terrible or violence, it's, there's a risk that you cannot actually develop a proper language when you grow up, or that you would use the same language when you grow up. But the good news is that children can handle everything, even children who experience things that we cannot even bear to think of, for example, violence and abuse in armed conflict. But children can heal if we take care of them, if we, if we present a, a quick initiative, if we give them care, uh, not just them, actually, but also their parents. We saw that also in the Saturday camp. And again, as been said before, it's, it's our responsibility as adults to take care of the children of the world. It's our responsibility to ensure that they have, that they get good and safe lives that, because they have this right to safeguard that right. And now I will actually address a person who has been mentioned today. Um, uh, uh, a person who I met just recently, just a few minutes ago, but I can, unfortunately, but I can sense that he has a lot to offer and that he has a lot of energy and that he wants to communicate, that he wants to speak. A person who experienced World War II or the concentration camps of World War II and the terrible things that happened there, he experienced that uh, himself. And, and after the end of World War II, he came to Denmark and met uh, Save the Children for the first time, the organization that today celebrates its 75th anniversary. And f following that, he actually is now, he's very Danish, extremely Danish, actually, even though he was original Dutch, uh, originally Dutch, he came from Amsterdam. And for many, many years uh, since that time, he has dedicated a great part of his life and his time to tell children and adolescents in Denmark about his experience, experiences and about he, because he got the right support, how he, he was able to move on and become the person that he is today. And as a patron of Save the Children, I'm so happy that I can actually hand over the uh, prize, an uh, honorary prize for a lifelong involvement or commitment to Josef Foss. Please come up here, Yusuf Foss. Oh, I've forgotten my speech. It's there. How, how can I remember what I'm supposed to say? Thank you so much, Your Royal Highness. 
this is an experience of a lifetime to meet you here today, sir, and have you give me this award. Thank you to Save the Children for this award that you have just bestowed upon me. Who would have thought that I'm standing here today in front of you in this great hall at the Danish Stock Exchange with a name tag, a fancy name tag on my suit? I've never tried that before. My lovely wife and grandchild is here today, sitting here in the two front rows. And I've had a long and happy life in Denmark. Well, except for 1943 to 45. I hope you can all hear me. But a life that was meant to be altogether different, if not for Save the Children. Almost exactly 75 years ago, on September 18, 1945, I came here by train to the Copenhagen Central Station and saw my Danish foster parents for the first time. I was nine years old. Also then, I was wearing a name tag, but it was made from cardboard in a string, on a string around my neck. That was all I brought with me from my home country. My shoes were wooden boards with a cloth strap around it. The trip to Copenhagen had been arranged by, Cop by Save the Children. My mother had responded to a small ad after we had gotten back from the camp. In the ad it said, if your child has gone to a concentration camp, and I, I had been in a concentration camp, for 18 months, we were in Bergen-Belsen, uh, me and my parents. They were working 24 hours a day. I sat in a sandbox and played with children. And one of the children I found out uh, later was Anne Frank. And most of you here today know her story. We had nothing, we had no toys, we had no school, but we made time go by with three daily turnip soups. In the morning we had turnip soup, in the afternoon we had turnip soup, but in the evening we had turnip soup with cumin uh, to make it more flavorful. On Jewish holidays, the Germans always came up with special activities, and they knew exactly when they were well, Jewish holidays. Our major uh, holiday is Yom Kippur. That day, I will never forget, I remember this, and a lot of what I'm talking about when I go around and give talks, these are things that I myself experienced and things that my parents told me after the war. Uh, Yom Kippur in Bergen-Belsen, we had to show up at 6 a.m. with our food bowl that we had been given when we came to the camp. It was a brown food bowl with a spoon, a fork, and a knife. At 6 a.m. at Yom Kippur, we uh, went for roll call to see if we were all present and we were there for maybe an hour and then a big truck came with gravel and this truck full of gravel poured the gravel, the sand on a corner of the, the roll call square and then in one line after one another, we had to use our food bowls and spoons. We thought we were being given extra food because it was Yom Kippur. Well, think again. So we came there with our spoon and our bowl uh, to this pile of gravel. And with our spoon, we were to fill up the bowl with gravel. We couldn't use the bowl to, to dig. No, we had to use a spoon to fill up the bowl. Once we had filled 
the bowl, we had to go from one corner to another corner and unload the gravel. And that's how we spent the entire day, the most holy of days uh, in, uh, for, for the Jewish people, Yom Kippur. More than one time during the war, my parents thought that now the end has come for us. But as some of as some of the only ones from our family, we survived. From my father and mother, we were about 200 people. And most of them perished in Auschwitz in the gas chambers. My aunt, my mother's sister, came back from the camp, from Auschwitz, and they all had a number tattooed on their arm. My aunt came home, and she had been with Dr. Mengele, and if you have read about Auschwitz and Dr. Mengele, you know that he used women for experiments that we in Denmark would use white mice for, and he did that. As I said, we were around 200 people from my father's and mother's side, and maybe four or five of us survived the war. We lost everything. We came back to the Netherlands. Our house was gone. Because in 1944, in the Netherlands, there was a terrible winter, and I assume the same applied to Denmark, and anything you could burn was stolen from where the Jews had been living because they were empty, because once the Jews had been taken, a big truck showed up and emptied the house or flat, and everything was taken to Germany. So there were all these empty buildings, and in the harsh winter of 1944, the Dutch came and removed everything that they could for firewood. Things were so bad that we would they would boil tulip bulb bulbs. What we would plant, they would boil tulip bulbs in order to have food. But as I said, my mother read an ad in the paper and she said to me, is that something that you would like to go to Denmark? I didn't know what I said yes to. I was only nine years old. I came to Denmark, I came to the central station in the evening on, of September 18th, uh, 1945, and a lot of people were standing there uh, greeting the children on the train. I found my foster parents, they found me, and the day after I had arrived in Copenhagen, my uh, foster parents took me to something called Dales Vauhus, a department store. And probably many of you remember, that was where you could go and buy whatever you needed at a reasonable price. My foster father, he was a driver in, um, in a shop in Copenhagen, for a shop in Copenhagen, and I would go with him uh, on a daily basis because I liked driving in a truck. I'd never tried that. A, a lot of uh, my friends who came on the same train, they went to school, but I didn't. I went with my father. He worked for a company called Aulin, and he would transport furniture and carpets, and I went with him every day. And the best part of my day, that's when we stopped to have uh, lunch and got a package of um, sandwiches. It was amazing for a small kid like me. 
After seven months in Denmark, I went back to Amsterdam, but later I returned to Denmark. I know I only have 15 minutes to talk, but when I go out to tell my story, and when I talk to people when I go out and tell my story, I spend like 90 minutes. But anyway, I came to Denmark in 1954, and I had uh, I went and did an apprenticeship where my foster father worked because my he his boss called me uh, UP. You know when you love a child you give him many names. So UP. I know you know this, sir. He said to me, UP, when you've finished school in Holland, come back to me for an apprenticeship. And I came back in 1954. On uh, June 15th, I came back to Denmark and I did a four-year apprenticeship. And then I settled. Once I had been trained, I had to go back for a while. I was a soldier, but uh, I, I didn't get in. I was the first Dutchman not to go do my mandatory military service because I got a letter from uh, uh, I got a letter from the hospital. I had osteomyelitis. I don't know if you know that uh, Latin, uh, Your Royal Highness. It's, I had a bit of an infection in my toe, and therefore I was uh, discarded as a possibility uh, as a soldier. You see, I am a bit nervous, maybe. And then I returned to Denmark, and during my time here, I got, I learned how to swim. I went to Tivoli. Oh my God, Tivoli! It was a, like a world sensation. I went on picnics with my company, and I, on April tenth, nineteen forty-six, they did. We did a farewell, um, um, a farewell. Uh, session because I had to go back for school, but both in back in Belsen and in Copenhagen, I had an age where I took everything on board, both good and bad. Today, the good experiences, they take up most of my um, the room that I have because I had a good life in Denmark, and I'm so happy that this anniversary conference of Save the Children is focusing on mental health of children working who are, who are growing up during war and crisis. I know how that is. I know how good that is to try and help them that way. I know what care means when you have gone through a an experience like I did, I know how important it is to regain your trust in other people. I know that abusive experiences, they can take root in you if you do not replace them with good, safe, comfortable experiences and that will allow you to move on. So it's been more than 75 years since I came to Denmark. But throughout the world, we still see suffering among children, unfortunately. Not since World War II, we have seen so many children as refugees. Luckily, Save the Children are able to help these children like I was helped. And luckily, since I was a child, we have become much wiser in how to support them psychologically to avoid them getting traumas, that is so, so, so important. In the time just before and after I, as a, as a young boy, came here with my name tag around my neck, I found it difficult to sleep. Once I was able to fall asleep, I would often dream that the Germans came after me. That problem I have not had since uh, I was a child. Now I lay my head on my pillow with my wonderful wife next to me, and then I sleep. Well, I have to get up a few times at night, but you 
that's not important. That's, you know, that's just old age. I have no question that Save the Children play a great role in me being here today in front of you. And that I was given an adult life without nightmares. I am so grateful. And I say that all the time when I go out on lectures uh, to schools and groups of uh, people. I never accept a fee. They always ask, how much do you charge? And I say, it's free of charge for me. But send your money to save the children. And they always do. And make sure you write yo, because how would they otherwise know where the money comes from? I hope that in the future you can give happy lives and happy futures free of nightmares to a lot of other children throughout the world. Congratulations on the anniversary, and thank you so much for inviting me here today. You, give, you, I have tears in my eyes. Thank you so much. So remember your award, sir. I will keep it on my nightstand. Thank you so much, Job, for telling us your story. Thank you so much to the protector of uh, Save the Children, Your Royal Highness, showing us all that this actually is worthwhile. So now the time has come to say goodbye to our honorary guests. You have to move on. The rest of you will stay for a little while, but let's stand up while our guests go out to show that we were so thank you for having you here today. Thank you.